You're about to join Jerry Parker, Maritz Siebert, and Niels Kostrup Larsen on their raw and honest journey into the world of systematic investing and learn about the most dependable and consistent yet often overlooked investment strategy. Welcome to the Systematic Investor Podcast Series. Welcome or welcome back to this week's edition of the Systematic Investor Series with Richard Brennan and I, Niels Kastor Larsen, where each week we take the pulse of the global markets through the lens of a rules-based investor. Now, for those of you who are regular listeners, our conversations are intended to give you as much of the nurture and encouragement as the turtles got back in the 1980s, as Jerry likes to put it. And if you're new to the show, we hope that today's episode will trigger your appetite to learn more by diving into the back catalog and listen to all of the past episodes that you may have missed. Like last week's episode with Mark, where we discussed and explained the importance of narrative and storytelling within our industry. I love when we get the chance to dissect some of these topics uh, that Mark brings along, and I invite you to check it out if you missed it. Rich, as ever, always great to see you this week. How are you doing down under? Very good, Niels. A bit bit shaken um, this week with a few of my moves in the portfolio, but apart from that, all good. It's getting very hot here, and um, climate change or just a typical summer, not quite sure yet. Right. Shaken but not stirred, I guess. But um, that's great to hear. We have a great lineup of topics that you brought along today, but before we get to that, let me just say that I am super excited to say that What I indicated last week, uh, we did in fact manage to get the new uh, Top Traders Unplugged website launched this week, thanks to some amazing work of my developer Shane. And even if it's only version 1.0 and, uh, you know, it hasn't been populated with all of the content that we plan for you, I hope that you will find it to be a much nicer interface than the old one. And as I said, this is only the beginning. I also want to give a huge shout out to uh, one of your countrymen, Rich, namely Dave W. from Australia, who left a really lovely review this week on Apple Podcast. I greatly appreciate these reviews, and it certainly helps with the motivation, as I was stressing out a little bit, getting the new website out this week, publishing also the first episode in our new volatility series with Jason and Harry, as well as coming up with lots of new ideas for content in the coming months. So thank you again, Dave. And uh, of course, if uh, you want to help grow the show, uh, you can either leave a a rating and review in in Apple Podcast, or you can uh, share the podcast by using a a link called toptradersonplug.com forward slash share and send it to some of your like-minded friends and colleagues. That's a great way And we certainly appreciate all of that. Now, it is month end, and the month of October did not disappoint in terms of market action, in particular within the inflation-related markets, I would say, which continues to be top of mind uh, of many uh, of the investors that I speak to. And after the kind of risk-off month of September, the appetite for risk returned big time during the Halloween month. And this week, we saw some short covering in bonds with an especially sharp move on Wednesday. On that day alone, by the way, the 10-year Treasury note plunged nine basis points. That's uh, pretty much. The fall in yield occurred despite mostly better than expected economic data. And what was also highlighted by an outstanding uh, five-year note auction, by the way. However, primary dealers dealers only bought 17.9% of the auctioned amount, and that's actually the third lowest result since 2004. But momentum was uh, enough to carry the 30-year note below 2% again for the first time since early September. And um, speaking of interest rates, following last week's Bank of England's announcement that a rate hike is imminent, the Bank of Canada followed suit this week and announced that they have ended their bond buying program effectively immediately. And um, in follow-up comments, the central bank hinted that they could begin raising rates as soon as April of next year. And that makes them the second G7 nation to back off of this pandemic-related emergency monetary policy. Let me just bring you in here, Rich, and uh, just to touch on some of the things that caught your attention during uh, October, maybe from a market perspective, maybe... We want to know how uh, what's the shape of your battleship at the moment. Yes, Neil. So um, the, the the battleship still floats. Uh, it, it's it's basically been um, treading water for a while. Um, but looking at 
some of the things that I'm riding at the moment, um, you know, my cotton and wheat seem to be doing quite well. Um, we're getting a, a nice sort of bullish trend in those particular commodities. In my uh, Forex universe, my um, Euro Canadian dollars um, doing very nicely in a short position. My USD JPY is showing a bit of light palladium. The energies, um, spot Brent, natural gas. Oats, um, I forgot to mention that in my commodities, and um, my Bitcoin, which um, seems to be doing all right as well. So apart from that, lots of whipsaws, treading water, battleship still floats, uh, sitting somewhere out in the Pacific Ocean. <laughs> well, I guess uh, treading water is better than taking water in, so uh, <laughs> I think that's the good news here. Didn't realize that you were trading Bitcoin, Rich. You keep surprising me, I have to say, and... Uh, Speaking about oats, yeah, I mean, oats up 25% in the month of October. Very interesting indeed. Uh, and of course, the commodities did have some interesting moves. On our side, our trend-following strategies actually had a pretty strong start to the fourth quarter. Risk-on sectors like equities and energies delivered very healthy returns, but also short-term interest rate markets provided some solid performance. Uh, other parts of the fixed income sector also enjoyed uh, a good month, albeit was a bit more muted, I have to say. Elsewhere in the strategy, we had small gains uh, with the exception of meat, uh, which was, I think, the only sector that lost a little bit of money in October. Now, what's interesting to me as kind of a, a long-term participant in the trend-following space it's also this it's it's this ongoing debate that you hear from um, certain pundits about the ability for trend following to continue to make money and so on and so forth. And given the fact that I work for a firm that's been around for a very long time, from time to time, I do a very simple study. Uh, it's not very scientific, but I look at our own performance in three different periods. I look at it from the inception of the strategy since 1984. And then I look at it from the first time we made a really big upgrade, uh, research upgrade to the strategy, and that was back in March 06. And then I also look at the strategy's performance since the last major upgrade, uh, which was in January 2013. And what's interesting about it is that uh, when you look at those three periods, the returns are almost identical the long term, the full track record is a little bit higher, but that's there's a reason for that because back in the 80s and 90s, et cetera, et cetera, there was a little bit of interest income that actually re uh, managers had to report in their return. So it's slightly higher. But since 2006 or seven, I think it is, we stopped accounting for that. We didn't want to put that into our composite track record because it's not really a return that we're generating. But anyway, so since 2006, and 2013, uh, the returns of the strategy is almost identical. And actually, the 2000 and turn to now returns are slightly better, which is kind of interesting to me because that period does not include the big crisis we had, which we know was a really good period for trend followers. So I think at least to me, it proves that trend following is in very good shape and it continues to produce uh, solid returns. As long as you don't look at, you know, one, two, three, five year, obviously that's going to be pretty volatile. But once you get a little bit out in terms of uh, track record, then it seems pretty robust and pretty stable. Now, from a volatility point of view, the S&P 500, of course, reached a new all-time high again this week, closing up about, um, I think, 1.3% for the week, obviously more for the month of October. Nevertheless, the VIX index actually increased a little bit, at least almost a point. And we saw some rather unusual moves, namely that they were moving in the same direction, uh, the VIX and the S&P futures, on two of the five days of this week. Now, there could be a few reasons for that. One explanation that I got from a colleague is that the increased option activity as both retail and institutional traders got active during the last few days. Retail was perhaps focusing, focusing on some of the big tech names as many released their quarterly results uh, with Tesla, of course, getting the most attention as it became the next $1 trillion plus company. Most of the Tesla options uh, trading was done either intraday or also in very short dated options expiring 
yesterday, Friday. And it will be interesting to see whether the unwinding of the dealer deltas positions will put pressure on the stock market next week. Although it was an active month, actually, for our volatility strategy, it uh, it played out such that it finished the month pretty flat, in fact. yeah. Now, for my own trend-following portfolio, uh, model portfolio, it was a down week, although it was an up month. So it finished the month of October up 3.48% leaving it up 7.97% for the year. Uh, performance so far uh, or for the month broke down that Model 1 uh, classical trend made a little bit, half a percent. Uh, group 2, which is trend following but with a long bias, uh, that made 4.37%, uh, but it was whipped around in the fast-reacting models, especially in things like bonds and, and uh, probably also equities coming out of, of a weak September into a strong October. So... Uh, all in all, up about 3.5%. Best uh, sectors, energy, space, metals, and short-term interest rates. And the worst sectors were equities, bonds, and meats. From a single market point of view, the best markets in October were zinc, crude oil, and gasoline. And at the bottom, we find copper, German Bund, and the Nikkei. In terms of trading activity this week, there was a bit of activity in the markets like Swiss franc, lean hawks, German Bunds, 10-year notes on Wednesday, of course. And also the euro and copper, as well as short-term interest rates in Euroland and the UK, but not, not a very hectic week. And in terms of the risk level in the portfolio, the risk to stop, it would lose 11.59% on Monday if all markets got stopped out, all positions got stopped out, which is down a little bit from 12.3% the week before. I think that's pretty much it before we dive into our topics of uh, of today. Rich is um, going to uh, basically uh, take over now and talk about a couple of very interesting points. I'll try and follow along the best I can and uh, see if I can come up with some um, clever questions along the way. But essentially, the first topic I think we are going to uh, dive into is about money makes money and the money that makes money makes money. Now, for those of you who are already a little bit confused, I'm going to ask you, Rich, to enlighten us about this eighth wonder of the world. All right, Niels. So in this this one, we're going to be talking about a secret source component. We often talk about diversification offering um, the free lunch, but um, compounding, uh, which we'll be discussing now, is another one of these free lunches provided that our return streams are asymmetrically orientated the right way to take advantage of the benefits of compounding as opposed to the disadvantages of compounding. So in a lot of our discussions that you and I have had, Niels, we have focused on how we use trend following to catch these things called outliers, which are these non-symmetrical anomalies, sorry, these non-linear anomalies that are um, asymmetrical in nature. Their, um, their, their magnitude or their extent is considerable in relation to the normal everyday trade uh, that you might get, which isn't an anomaly. So um, this non-linearity that exists within these, these anomalies gives us this asymmetry in our trade results. We see that in when we look at our, our trade distribution of returns, and we see about 5 to 10% of them are the things that actually account for all of our profit, and the rest is this linear randomness, effectively. But it's this non-linear asymmetry that is our outliers. Yeah, I'm going to stop you there because um, I, I heard a great analogy about that when you think about these uh, distributions, right? And people know what that shape looks like. And it's uh, the analogy is a little bit too uh, sort of uh, European football or soccer as they would call it in the US, right? Because when you think about it, a lot of effort, a lot of play happens in the middle of the uh of the, of the pitch, right? So a lot of the time, most of the or most of the time the ball is in the middle of the pitch. But where it's really crucial and where games are determined is actually in the two penalty boxes, right? So at the two extremes of the pitch, that's where the that's the most important part of the pitch, right? And and what you're saying is actually also when when we take our very quant type hats on and we think about distributions and fat tails and and what have you, 
those are exactly the areas that we are most interested in because a lot of the time where you're just looking at the at the thick part of the distribution, the middle part of the distribution, it's neither here nor there. And as trend follows, it's part of what we have to go through to get to one of these outliers. And in our case, of course, we prefer to be attacking in that penalty box and not so much defending in in our own penalty box. So anyways, back to your uh, back to your thunder. I just thought of, of that. No, it's a very good point. It, it's basically highlighting the fact that the major success stories and the major failures of trade traders when they underestimate the extremity of these extremes. So the most successful traders in the world owe their success to maybe a handful of outliers throughout their entire trading careers. Uh, these are the things that set themselves up. The majority of the rest of the time they're spent effectively with small up and down changes that don't really get you very far, but then you get these major transition events. And of course, those those traders that, that fail in their careers and meet risk, risk of ruin head on are those ones that fail to uh, realise the importance of these extreme anomalous events because their assumption is that things are much more predictable than what the reality actually says it is. So in our trend-following world, we are very much focused towards taking advantage of these extreme opportunities, but in a beneficial way. Our whole modus operandi is geared towards allowing us to uh, have this unlimited upside potential while we can, we always um, cut our losses short and prevent our, our risk side of the equation going towards the extreme tail end of the, the negative side of the distribution of returns. So that this gives us this asymmetry in our returns. And on top of that, we then add diversification as a principle to hunt far and wide for these outliers to increase the trade frequency of these asymmetrical nonlinear features in the market. So those two things in combination, which is where a lot of the emphasis of our discussions have been before, set ourselves up to create a an uncompounded return stream or, a, or an equity curve that is asymmetrically orientated in nature. Um, it means that when we have good conditions, favourable conditions to our cause, we get these beneficial uplifts in our equity curve, significant nonlinear uplifts in our equity curve. But at other times when conditions are unfavourable, we don't experience these, these similar um, nonlinear downturns. We just get small losses chipping away to create these progressively building drawdowns, but they don't go um, into sort of a nonlinear free fall into negative territory. So that asymmetry, once we've got that asymmetry, that's when we apply this additional secret source, which is a free lunch, because we've already configured our equity curve to achieve this asymmetry, then we can apply the principles of compounding to further amplify that nonlinearity in our equity curve. So compounding, I think they said that Einstein, you're already, you, you already stole my thunder by taking this quote, but Einstein supposedly referred to compounding as the eighth wonder of the world. And he said, um, he who understands it earns it, and he who doesn't pays it. So that suggests that there's a two-edged sword to this, this term called compounding, which we'll get into later. But I, I think it was Benjamin Franklin, this is where you stole a quote, Benjamin Franklin was the one who stated, money makes money, and the money that money makes makes money. So... The principle we're dealing with is something that we learn in high school when we learn about um, how we you know, invest our money in a bank account. And um, if we allow the interest to be reinvested into that, um, that, that bank account that slowly progressively builds our wealth in that bank account, and then the, the miracles of compounding that, um, that um, equity takes over in our bank accounts, to deliver at the end of a 20, 30 year long term time frame a significant increase in our overall wealth simply by applying this principle of money makes money on money. So, what this is doing is it's saying compounding is, is a, a method that requires us to think in terms of the notion of what we refer to as path dependency. 
what we mean there is that uh, when we have a compounded series, we're applying a finite growth rate to a something like an, an average annual rate of, say, 5% to a finite series, like an amount of equity. We could also apply it to the number of viruses. We could apply it to um, a growing population, uh, you know, a finite number of people. And over a particular interval, that, that, um, that number builds. And then uh, at that next compounding period where that interest is paid or when that calculation of compounding is undertaken, we reinvest that back into that original sum. So therefore, at the next compounding period, when we apply that same rate, we lift the, the, um, the investment by not only the original investment, but the accumulated returns we've built over that compounding period. So it's an incredibly important concept, but it produces what we call a nonlinear curve or an exponential function. Now, humans um, find it hard to understand what exponential functions are because in our mind, we tend to think of things in a linear way. Like when we deal with rates of return, we're thinking in terms of additive rates of return. So we're thinking in terms of uh, what we call a, a form of um, arithmetic average called the arithmetic return. So when we get a series of returns like 5%, uh, another 5%, 10%, 5%, 20%, um, when we sum up those, those um, returns over that investment period and we divide it by the number of periods in that investment cycle, we just get a, a, linear, um, a linear function called the arithmetic return, which is an, uh, 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 surrounds a principle of having a, a fixed sum of money and we apply a constant rate of growth to that fixed sum of money that sum of money never returns. We just build interest on that fixed sum of money. That's the notion of an arithmetic mean. But when we're talking about a geometric mean, we need to look at the impact of the path that that, uh, that sum that we are applying a growth rate alters over a time series. And that's referred to as a geometric return. So a geometric return differs to an arithmetic return because now we introduce a number of, of compounding periods the initial value of our investment, the rate of return applied to each compounding period. And those three variables all sort of um, interrelate to each other to impact the overall path of that investment series over time. So that's what we call a geometric return. Now, there is another way called the, the log return. And a log return is very similar to a geometric return. But all it does is it drops the notion that we're applying discrete compounding intervals into that series. It assumes that compounding is continuous across the series as opposed to discrete. So when I say discrete, when we look at compounding, we often think of compounding on an annual basis where we apply a rate per year um, to a particular investment at the beginning of that year and then it builds to a level that at the end of that year, we then apply that rate again. So we are compounding annually in that case. But a log return applies the principle of compounding continuously over the entire series. Now, log returns are, are very useful because what they do when you apply a log return to, say, an equity curve, we can um, the log return visually um, displays the... the um, the non-compounded path of that return series. What that does is it's a way to basically say lots of people compound in different ways, but if we apply a log return basis of calculation to that investment series, we can actually eliminate the impacts of compounding to see what the underlying geometry is of that uncompounded series. So when I'm looking at <coughs> comparisons between fund managers like Paul Mulvaney and different fund managers, I know that they are compounding. I just don't know what frequency they're doing it. So what I can do is take log returns of their monthly returns um, to uh, look at what is the geometry of that series of the different fund managers so I can compare each on an uncompounded basis. Because compounding, as we all know, has the ability to significantly exponentially magnify returns so when, for instance, if we're dealing with a, 
a long-term series of 20 or 30 years and I've got a, um, an uncompounded series that might generate a few million dollars at the end of that series. When I apply compounding, say, monthly or, or annually to that series, the impact of that compounding treatment exponentially magnifies the result to not just be $2 million, but $20, $30 million. So you can see what actually does the heavy lifting over the, the long-term track record of a fund manager. Yes, the, the, the systems are important, the diversification is important. That creates this asymmetry and this geometry. But what really does the heavy lifting? What sets our wealth story into, um, you know, um, legendary status for a lot of these long-term trend followers is this principle of compounding. Does that make sense? It does make sense. I was, I was just curious while you uh, take a breather here, I was just curious actually, do you think that Einstein, when he called it the eighth wonder of the world, thought that, um, that we could have negative interest rates? I'm pretty sure he never even considered that. <laughs> Perhaps the, the quantum mechanics blokes like Schrodinger in this sort of Schrodinger's cat experiment sort of uh, looked at this alternative universe where there were negative interest rates and positive interest rates. So maybe he appreciated it, but perhaps Einstein didn't. No, exactly. I mean, I think we all thought about it as uh, something like in a one dimension, but uh, as as Europeans, we certainly know now, but uh, it goes both ways, uh, so to speak. And of course, when you talk about compounding and how that really benefits um, trend followers, I, I guess we would have to say it, it benefits all types of strategies that has positive long-term returns um, and and adjust their equity along the way. I mean, you mentioned that you don't know how, how often people kind of compound, but I would imagine that most managers, for example, if, if we start with a million dollars in, in, in AUM and we make 10% in, in October, our starting AUM will be, um, I can't remember what I said we, the starting capital was, but if it's a million, it'll be 1.1 million for, for the 1st of November. So there is that, but you know, likewise, we will reduce our AUM uh, starting point in months where we have a, a negative. Yeah, And I know we, and I'm not going to, derail the discussion into that side of things which you know we obviously talked with jerry about many times about how he sets his trade level in a different way and i think you do as well but from what I, my experience at least is that most managers that i've come across they will adjust their trade level at least once a month when the new month starts but some managers will do it even daily that's what we do at our shop because that's the AUM we manage on that day. So, but that's not the discussion for today. I'm going to let you continue down the uh, path, so to speak. All right. So, to, to we need to now dig into this con concept of what is compounding. So, a good way to imagine it is um, there's there's a rule we can apply in our head to understand this exponential function. Because, as I mentioned before. Humans tend to think, we, we tend to think in terms of linear returns. We don't think in terms of this power of exponential returns. And the reason I can be confident in saying that is because whenever I look at GDP reports or whenever I look at um, resource reports from, um, from uh, mining companies, uh, there's always this uh, notion that um, positive growth is valuable. And uh, you know, they'll talk about a positive uh, rising human population, which is favourable. They'll talk about positive um, results in GDP, which are favourable. But on this finite planet we exist in, unfortunately, the application of a finite growth rate to a finite planet produces this exponential resource exploitation, and we run into problems here. And we can use a rule to um, look at the power of this exponential function. And we've referred before in a prior episode to this power law function. And this is exactly what compounding is. It produces this exponential function, which is known as a power law, which means as time progresses, the exponential move in that gets bigger and bigger. And so when someone says to me, we have something that we're applying a growth rate of 5% per annum, to uh, an original investment or uh, an amount of resource that's going to be used by a mining company or whatever, they say, what is the doubling time? In other words, what time is required to achieve a 100% increase in that 
investment. So we can apply a simple calculation. We can apply a rule of 70. It's actually 72, but to round it down, we can apply a rule of 70, which is effectively, I think it's 100 times the log 2 return. There's a, there's a mass reason behind the rule of 70, but it's because we're looking at the doubling time. We're applying a, a log 2 to uh, a, 100 times the log 2 number. If we're tripling it, uh, we'd be using 100 times log 3. So that um, but anyway, this 70 rule means I've got 5% per annum. What's the time it takes to double it? So I go 70 divided by 5 equals 5 into 75, Niels. Uh, About 13, 14. 13, 14. 13 to 14 years to double the amount. If we're dealing with 10% growth rate, you can see that the doubling time is actually uh, 70 divided by 10 or, or seven years effectively to double. Now, this exponential function, um, it, it, this power law, uh, the power of the power law is that let's say we have doubled our investment after a doubling time of, say, 10 years, um, and we're now going for the 11th year. What you realise, in, in the 11th year, you're investing a larger amount than the entire history of the 10 years before that is summated to that particular point in time. Every time you step up one interval of this exponential function, you are dealing with a sum that is the sum total of the entire history and then some. So you can see how this exponential function um, really takes off. And so in a positive way, we can take advantage of that leverage by that power law um, by creating this asymmetry in our equity path. Now, we talk about, well, you know, clearly any system that produces a long-term return with positive expectancy and this asymmetry, surely they're all equivalent. Well, no, they're not. Certain systems produce a greater asymmetry than other systems. So fortunately, in our trend-following world, we are, we are really focusing on this asymmetry with our system technique, our method of diversification, the fact that we are exploiting these asymmetrical outliers. So we get this greater level of asymmetry in our underlying return streams. Yes, we get a volatile path, but there is this baked in asymmetry into the long-term returns, which is really powerful for, um, for compounding to take hold of and lift it. Convergence strategies, on the other hand, produces very linear equity curves. So let, if we compare and contrast the uncompounded equity curves of a trend follower versus a convergent model. A trend follower has these um, beneficial outliers that um, asymmetrically lift up that equity curves um, several multiples more than what the, the adverse events do, but we do get these slow building drawdowns, but we get what we call a stepped up equity curve, not a linear equity curve, but a stepped up equity curve that is often quite volatile. People think that that volatility is negative for compounding, but provided that those step-ups exceed the adverse downturns of the, um, the equity curve, that is beneficial for this compound, this exponential function to take hold of that and lift it over the long term to create this um, accelerated exponential function of our wealth. We achieve a better result than what convergent models do because they are focusing on a smooth equity curve. They're focusing on eliminating the non-linearity in that equity curve through methods that, um, for instance, they might take some profit off the table. They're reducing the, the, the asymmetry in that series by substituting that with more regular profits, but reducing the possible asymmetry of it. And that has an impact in compounding in that compounding doesn't have the ability to exponentially lift that series as to such a great degree as we do with our method. So it's giving a, an explanatory reason for um, the power of our method, even though it might appear ugly vi visually, it's um, orientated to really take advantage of this principle of compounding. So given what you said there and comparing it to, say, a convergent strategy, which is, of course, much more stable uh, until it's not, so to speak, and it has its large drawdown, I mean, I imagine that... This is also why it's it, this only really becomes meaningful in terms of of using this kind of uh, analysis 
if you look at long-term periods, right? Because in theory, we could start today and we could go into a five-year drawdown. And obviously, that's not going to make our case for as trend followers. But as I was talking about earlier today, when I look at our returns, as soon as I get out to kind of a, a longer term time frame, seven, eight, pl 10 plus years, the returns become very stable, in fact. And so I imagine that that is something we need to mention that you, you can't use this kind of analysis and you won't get the benefit, of course, uh, unless you have a long term horizon. Would that be fair? Yeah, that, that's a that's a, a fair um, um, idea. Look, just in relation to that, it's important to um, that we when we're dealing with compounding, uh, we're only talking about something that really takes hold 20, 30 years into the track record of a fund manager. Because this principle, whilst it sort of um, takes off with an exponential function, the, the true growth of it occurs later in the series, provided everything goes your way. So... That means you need a track record to experience the benefits of compounding. Now, most traders, many traders um, who haven't had a long-term track record never experience what we're talking about. They'll be saying, oh, what's this compounding? I understand the principle, but I can't really see it generating me additional wealth in my equity curve currently. Uh, it's more important to focus on my trades, all of these things. But they miss the big picture when you start zooming out and seeing, you know how uh, we experience this volatility over the short term, and as we zoom out to take a longer term, longer term, longer term picture, the volatility starts decreasing and we see this asymmetry in our equity curve. You'll see that, you know, if we focus on a year or two years, we see this volatile signature that we can't see a clear asymmetry in the profile. But as we take 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, and we step back out um, and zoom out, the volatility dissipates and we start seeing this exponentially linear growing function. You'll see that even in Paul, even, you know, uh, Mulvaney, who's got a very volatile um, track record, but a stunning one. Um, if you zoom back out, you'll see that, you know, what, what was everyone worried about? Um, you know, when you look at it uh, in terms of a 30-year track record, the impact of a 50% drawdown seems, you know, small in the scheme of what this exponential function has produced over the long term. Yeah, no, no, absolutely, and of course, uh, I, 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 I see exactly the what the point you're making when I look at our track record. I mean, we got 37 years of track record in in our main strategy, um, and 47 for the for the full full firm. And what you can see, of course, is that if your total return is, and I'm just picking a number, 10,000 percent over that time frame, which is probably not that far off, then of course. The last 100%, so to speak, in real terms, is what gets you from 5,000% to 10,000%. And that's what people forget. So uh, this is also why Warren Buffett is so successful, right? Because he's been doing it for so long. Yes. It also gives credence to why we have a systematic process, a rules-based systematic process, and why we're focused on the next 1,000, 2,000 trades, as opposed to the importance of the next trade. We we're looking for the long term and we're looking for this rules-based process that we apply that um, provided we adopt that rules-based process, it enforces this asymmetry in our return series that actually gives us a, a, a beneficial asymmetry to then lift it to the heavens with compounding. Absolutely. So where do we go next with this? Okay, so what we need to do, so we've probably discussed compounding to death, but before we leave compounding, we've just got okay. to recognise the, the two-edged sword that accompanies compounding. And whilst we are talking about um, trend followers producing this uncompounded asymmetric geometry that is beneficial for compounding, if you go the other way and you go into the, the left tail area, the non-linearity produces a, an amplified deceleration as well of wealth returns if you go the other way and you allow things to go non-linear in the other way, in the converse way to what we've been speaking about. So there's this two-edged sword to compounding, and it's, it's just like when they talk about the two-edged sword of leverage. 
compounding is a way to leverage your returns because of this exponential power law that's that's building your 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 wealth story over the course of time yeah no absolutely and i think the, the other part to the story and and i think that's where where you plan to go and that's also that you know returns are not necessarily returns meaning it it depends on how those returns are generated and in what order they're generated and this is what we when we talk about path dependency something that you and i will be publishing some more work on uh, in the not too distant future it makes a big difference and it also makes a big difference as to how we should judge different strategies because right now for example, everybody loves the sharp ratio, and and you kind of just uh, you know use that as a de facto term for how good are you to generate returns. But actually, it's probably one of the worst uh, ratios to use because it doesn't look at at the path you took or or your strategy took to get to to that sharp ratio. Um, and so let's go into that area a little bit, yeah. uh, if you don't mind, because I think it's something. I think it's something that people don't talk about a lot. It's a little bit more complex than just calculating a sharp ratio. And I don't mean to go into the stuff that you and I will come out with uh, as, as such. But I just want to talk about path dependency and the importance of it and, and why it matters to uh, be aware of, uh, for sure. Yeah, so th this principle of path dependence is tied to what we've been discussing, this compounding feature, this, yeah. this asymmetry or this nonlinearity in the path. So what, what this means is, let's take an example. Um, you know, if we start with $100 and we have a 10% a increase on that $100, we lift our return to $110, yeah. a, a $10 increase. If we decrease our returns by, say, 10%, we reduce our, our starting capital of $100 to $90. Now, in this arrangement where we've got this multiplicative process applied to a prior amount of $100, um, which is this compounding treatment, we find that there's an asymmetry created in that relationship. In other words, we have declined 10% to go to 90%. But if we increase then again from $90, 10%, we go to $99 instead of back to $100. There's this asymmetry that's created through this exponential function uh, with this decline in our wealth to $90. Now, let's go to a more extreme example where we see this exponential power law unfold. Let's say we uh, we drop by 50% from that $100 start. We're down to $50. Now, we don't need to lift 50% to get back to $100. We've actually got to lift 100% to go back to that $50. This is this nonlinearity being expressed where we saw a 10% decline, only drop it down by uh, you know a 1% difference. Now, we're dealing with a 50% increase on top of that because of this non-linearity. So the impact of this geometric series or this, this uh, multiplicative process on our path shows you how critical it is uh, on the, the actual geometry of that path that it takes and when it's being compounded, what level is that preceding level of equity. So if we have a big lift in our equity, we get a beneficial lift in our future compounding, provided that equity stays up there and doesn't come down. When we, we go the reverse and we get the non-linear two-edged sort of compounding hit into uh, returns, we see this non-linearity being expressed with the compounding impact and diluting our wealth. So this is what we mean by path dependence. And to, to dig into that a bit deeper, we, we probably need to understand a, a concept called ergodicity, which... Um, Tell, say do, that again. Shall we go into that? Ergodicity. <laughs> no, I knew the word was going to come up at some point, but I, when, <laughs> I, when I saw the name, I thought, what, what on earth is ergodicity? I'm sure I'm not the only one. So can you... I know it has something to do with the path, so to speak, and, and how these returns are... Uh, showing up, but but can you explain that maybe a little bit uh, for everyone? Yes. Yeah, so um, ergodicity is used to exp fundamentally ergodicity is used to express how the points of a moving system behave, and it's a branch of mathematics used to study um, statistical properties of dynamic systems. So okay, mm -hmm. that's a bit of a mouthful. So let's let's examine what we we mean here. So. Typically, when we think of averages, there are two ways to think of averages in an ergodic system. So under an ergodic system, 
it is assumed that there is an equivalence between the way we view things in a time series over the path, a time series, versus how we view an ensemble of systems. So what this is saying is that let's take an example of an ensemble of systems like portfolios that we use, which are ensembles of systems, ensembles of strategies. We tend to, when we, we, we can use the principle of averaging that ensemble to produce an average result, but what we are doing there is we are averaging over a spatial distribution of the different systems. Or in an ergodic system, there is an equivalence between doing an average that way in a spatial distribution of different systems located at different points in space to saying whether well, that is equivalent to running a single system over almost an infinite time series where we then break up that time series into I- interval, uh, intervals and then assume that those intervals are the same as an ensemble of spatially distributed systems. So it's saying that an ergodic system <clears throat> is equivalent spatially and temporarily. But we know, we've just examined a case in compounding where time and the the changing nature of equity over a time series is different. We can't treat it the same as with the assumption that it is an ergodic process. So an ergodic process in physics is something like when smoke fills a room, and what it means is that It's a statistical distribution of mechanics where the smoke visits every possible spatial point in that room. So imagine um, if we put a gas into a room, it distributes to all spatial points of that room. That is an ergodic process. But when we're dealing with a non-ergodic process, there is an asymmetry between the spatially distributed ensemble average and the time distributed average. So this is where we get a difference between this, what we call a geometric return and the arithmetic return. The difference is because an arithmetic return, an additive-based assumption of returns, assumes ergodicity, but a geometric return uh, needs to know when things are compounded, what was your initial equity, what was your final equity, what was the rate applied at each interval, time interval, so the time, the, the, the path of that return is important. Now, mm. Ole Peters sort of wrote this up in his paper, a very um, popular paper um, called The Ergodicity of Economics, because unfortunately, th- this assumption of ergodicity is basically embedded in a lot of current economics, modern portfolio theory, discounted cash flow theory, um, a lot of macroeconomics the assumption of ergodicity is in there so that when you have an equivalence between a spatially distributed average and a temporally distributed average, you can do a clever thing in mathematics where you can drop this need to assess things from a time distribution perspective and just take the ensemble average to give you an uh, an average aggregate. And because you're assuming ergodicity, you're assuming that the spatially distributed average and the temporally distributed averages are the same. But in a non-ergodic process, if you, if you use that assumption, you get very incorrect conclusions. And Ole Peters highlights this in a really good gambling game. Now, I know what we've been talking about is hard to understand, but let's talk about this gambling game to really sort of understand what Ole Peters is going on about. This gambling game... I think that would be helpful okay. at this stage. Yeah. So... In his gambling game, he starts with um, $100 at, on a gamble. The, the probability of a win and the probability of a loss is 50%. Okay, so mm-hmm. equal okay. opportunity to win and to lose. Let's say it's a coin toss gamble, starting with $100. But the reward paid for winning is a 50% increase in your original equity. So mm-hmm. if we start with $100 and we win, we get an additional $50, so $150. If you lose, you only lose 40% of your original equity, so you lose $40. So the way our brains tend to sort of look at things linear, linearly, 
So when we look at this, we say, that seems a pretty fair bet to me because I know 60% win, uh, sorry, 50% win, 40% loss, it's tilted in my favour. In fact, I can apply an expectancy um, to that equation to develop this, this positive expectancy equation, which is this assumption of ergodicity in this um, broad assumption of this gambling game. Under ergodicity, yes, it would be um, a positive expectation. But what you do, when we undertake um, a thousand different um, separate trials of this gambling game, over 1,000 trials, we find that every single sample deteriorates in equity over the long term. It all decays. There is no positive expectancy for any individual run of the entire 1,000 um, um, simulations performed on any particular single gambling game that you undertake using this principle. Now, the reason that it's hard to understand how that occurs until we start thinking back to what I told you before about when we drop 50% in value, you've got to get 100% increase. Right, right. In. Yep. So when you start thinking non-linearly, li sorry, non-linearly, uh, uh, these tongue twisters are sort of getting to me, Neil. I think you've chosen some of the most difficult words that we could find uh, I know. Uh, for, you this, know, for this episode. Non-linearity and multiplicative, that tends to sort of do me over for about a day. But um, especially when you say them quickly. They're... The, there is actually this non-linearity, this asymmetry in this simple gambling game, which we need to overcome to achieve positive expectancy. And unfortunately, when we only win 50% and, and lose 40%, it's not sufficient to overcome the asymmetry. So if we lift it to 60% win to 40%, it's still not sufficient to overcome the, um, that asymmetry and we get a deteriorating sequence over 1,000 trades. When we get to 80% to a 40%, yes, we start getting positive expectancy. So you can start seeing how the geometry starts to be a very important driver in determining the necessary degree of asymmetry we need in our returns to um, get the benefits of compounding over the long term. Does that make sense? It does make sense. So I'm going to try and uh, you may have more things you want to uh, share, so uh, feel free. But I'm going to try and also uh, make it into more sort of a uh, a practical way that I think of this and also how I think about why we've been going on for, you know, now seven years at the, on the podcast, uh, suggesting to people that they everybody should have trend following in their portfolio. Because what, what I think is clear now is, of course, that all investors, what we really should try and avoid is this, is, are these huge drawdowns, right? So if we, because we have to overcome that um, by making up a lot more given this asymmetry right so 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 if we think about what most investors have in their portfolios it's equities right so um so a healthy dose of equities now we know from the from history we we, we just haven't seen it in the last uh, 12 years but we know from history that equities from time to time will go through a 50 or 60 or in case of the Nasdaq, an 80 plus percent drawdown. And that's devastating to long term wealth creation, let alone the timing risk that investors will have if they need the money at the time of this drawdown or crisis. So the way I, I want to think about why trend following in a very visual way is helpful and why everyone should have trend following if they own stocks is because of the non-correlated nature of our returns and often but not guaranteed but often negatively correlated performance during a, a real equity crisis it essentially lifts the floor of the overall portfolio so the overall portfolio won't go in a 60 percent drawdown if you have a healthy allocation to trend following, it may only go to a 30 or a 40 percent drawdown. And that allows the overall portfolio to compound, going back to, to your compounding uh, case, compound from a higher level. And this is why when I when I do the experiment of saying, OK, what what does a 50 port, 50 50 portfolio between equities and say what we do at Don over the long period of time do to a portfolio? 
and let's just for argument's sake say that you know if you had invested in 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 equities alone you would have gotten to a uh, you know your portfolio would have gone from say $100 to $130 and if you have invested in the same period in uh, in our trend following it might have gone to say $150 right so trend following generally or we've generally done better than equities but the point I'm trying to make is that if you combine them 50-50, the net result won't be 130 or 150 or somewhere in between. It's going to be like 170, 180. So you get a much better overall return, which is hard to understand when you hear, oh, but you're just, you're just getting two return streams. How can they be better than any of the two? But it can because it allows your overall portfolio to compound at a much better level all the time if, of course, the correlations generally will continue to be what we've seen in the last 50, 60 years, which I have no doubt it will. And that's the important, that's the practical example that people need to kind of burn into their brain when it comes to portfolio construction, which of course is what Ray Dalio has been preaching in his holy grail. You need to combine 15, 20 uncorrelated return streams that is the best way to build long-term wealth. The problem is most investors can't find, even professional investors can't find 15 or 20 uncorrelated return streams. But you can find, but you don't need 15 or 20 in my opinion. You need four or five, I think, um, which is also why we talk about, you know, the 100-year portfolio and and all of that good stuff. I mean, yeah, if you can find four or five truly uncorrelated return streams, you combine those, that is, pro and without knowing what the future holds, which none of us know, it is probably the safest and 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 most predictable way to generate the best long term returns that you can. And 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 in terms of a little bit of a good news that I just picked up this morning, um, I noticed that the Q three uh, return or, or, or report from from um, maybe um, yeah one of these publications actually suggest that for the first time in a long time, there's ne net inflows into CTAs and trend follows, which made me very happy. Of course, it's way too late because it's been it's going been going the other way for the last few years. But but it is nice to see that there are some people who are, are starting to realize the importance of this. And, and, and actually coming to your point about compounding, I think, you know, if, if we're going into some level of more sustained inflation, I mean, interest rates or bonds, they will start compounding at an, on the negative side, just like short-term interest rates in Europe. It's going to be devastating for the 60-40 portfolio, frankly. Yes. Look, um, one of the things you're talking about, um, we've got to have this focus towards risk-adjusted returns. And, and when we're talking about risk-adjusted returns, we're looking at how we're using um, all of these uncorrelated return streams, when they collectively get applied together, to produce this this best overall risk-adjusted performance, and that that is that's basically an area that trend followers really focus on. Their their entire emphasis is on um, wide diversification, choosing as many uncorrelated return streams as possible to produce this risk-adjusted best risk-adjusted return, which comes back to this concept of the best optimal path for um, you know compounding. Now, interestingly, Niels, in a prior episode, I talked to you about how trend followers extract serial correlation from the market data. And what we find is this notion of path dependence um, arises from serial correlation that's present in an equity curve. So to understand that, when if you imagine as traders we are exploiting this serial correlation in the market data, the trade results we produce must be a derivative expression of that and that derivative expression is this notion of path dependence. So there, there is this, this causal bias in our equity curve that causes this asymmetry, uh, which uh, is, is therefore this thing that compounding takes hold of. So uh, because of our method, because we are attacking these outliers which are asymmetrical in nature, because we are widely diversifying to increase our frequency of um, um, attacking these asymmetrical features, uh, we've got this this great geometry, which then we compound to to lift it to the heavens in in a long term track record. 
So pretty well that takes me to the end of this path dependence, but we can see how important the, the underlying path is um, to the impacts of compounding. And there are examples, for instance, that you and I have seen where uh, we get three different investment alternatives offering different return paths. They, they commence at the same point. They end at the same point in an uncompounded um, path, um, but certain of those paths are better for compounding than other paths. So there are certain geometries which are ideally suited towards compounding, and there are certain geometries which uh, are significantly hampered by the effects of compounding by virtue of its the two-edged sword that compounding plays. And back to Einstein's quote, he who earns it, or he who understands it, earns it. He who doesn't, pays it. And that sort of wraps that sort of side of things up. Yeah, no, and hopefully a lot of people will understand a lot better after this um, masterclass by you in terms of uh, compounding and path dependence. I think it's uh, very important. I'm sure we'll come back to it, and we'll certainly come back to it in the written material we're working on. So uh, there'll be plenty of opportunity for people to go and revisit and even maybe even learn how to spell ergodicity or whatever the word was. <laughs> uh, so so uh, So we will see. Now, before I jump into some of the uh, month-end performance numbers and all of that good stuff for the industry, was anything else you wanted to bring up, or was that kind of the the thrust of it? That's the thrust of it. I'm exhausted. My, I'm tongue tied, and um, I, I've um, yeah, I'm not going to say those words anymore for a, at least a few days. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds good. Well, speaking of good news, actually, it, it is nice to once again look at the industry and how it's been performing uh, of late. And October certainly didn't, dis didn't disappoint. Now, of course, these numbers are as of Thursday, so that we still had one trading day left. I think yesterday was, if anything, maybe a little bit of a positive day for, for the industry. So I imagine these numbers might improve a little bit but it doesn't really matter it was a great month for the uh, for the industry so the beta 50 up another 2.66 percent as of thursday up 11.28 percent um that's probably one of the better years we've seen in a very long time sock gen cta index up also 2.2 percent up nine and a half percent for the year so far trend index uh, flying at the moment up 2.63 percent up 13.42 percent for the year beating even uh, 2019, which was a great year. And uh, the SOCGEN Short-Term Traders Index, also positive now, one up 1.63% uh, for the month and up 1.98% for the year, you know, trailing a little bit the last couple of years, but uh, nice to see it in positive territory. The trend barometer, my own trend barometer that you can now see in a new New colors, new format, new clothes, as uh, Rich called it earlier this week on Twitter. Um, it finished at 52, confirming the good conditions we see for trend followers at the moment, even though, of course, my portfolio of markets is very different from other managers, but it seems to be catching um, you know, the main trends, and therefore it's, very, it's a very good indicator of how the environment for trend following is. The SOCGEN Multi-Alternative Risk Premium Index, on the other hand, had a negative month, down 1.11%, still up 4.84% uh, for the year. Now, of course, we've already mentioned it, equities had another great month, another uh, all-time high in the S&P and probably a few other indices. Uh, MSCI uh, World up 5.59% in October, up 18% for the year, so flying. Um, and the World Government Bond Index, um, well, it's down 0.21% for the month of October. So not having such a great time. And um, yeah, next week, Rob is back. So that will be fun. I'm sure we'll have some interesting topics to talk about there. And so send your questions to the usual email, info at toptradersonplug.com. We'll do our very best to uh, get those answered for you. And um, yeah, if you wouldn't mind sharing the podcast and leave a rating and review, we uh, would certainly appreciate that. And hopefully you'll see as you uh, tune into the website over time, you'll see some uh, some of the uh, content that I've been talking about uh, that Rich and I have been working on slowly showing up as long with, by the way, more episode in the new volatility series hosted by Jason. We had Harry 
Christian on this week. Um, great conversation. If you thought today's was a, um, a a nerdy topic and difficult to understand, just uh, wait till you dive into the world of volatility. That's a, a, a not to crack for sure. But um, they do a great job. It's fun. And there's some uh, really interesting guys coming in the next few weeks. I'm trying to publish those episodes on Wednesday. So you get something in over the weekend, ideally Sunday, from uh, from the Systematic Investor Series. And then midweek, a volatility update. Maybe it's a Thursday sometimes, but thereabouts. I think that's pretty much it for today. Um, Rich and me, we uh, appreciate your time, your patience. And we look forward to being back with you next week. Until next time, take care of yourself and take care of each other. Thanks for listening to the Systematic Investor Podcast Series. If you enjoy this series, go on over to iTunes and leave an honest rating and review. And be sure to listen to all the other episodes from Top Traders Unplugged. If you have questions about systematic investing, send us an email with the word question in the subject line to info at toptradersunplugged.com and we'll try to get it on the show. And remember, all the discussion that we have about investment performance is about the past, and past performance does not guarantee or even infer anything about future performance. Also understand that there's a significant risk of financial loss with all investment strategies, and you need to request and understand the specific risks from the investment manager about their products before you make investment decisions. Thanks for spending some of your valuable time with us, and we'll see you on the next episode of The Systematic Investor.